fine Wednesday. <clears throat> Hopefully pretty well. Um, so, um, looks like uh, we're supposed to get snow later today here in Crawfordsville and maybe again on Thursday, which is uh, kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, so I was just four of you this morning. Oh, man, this is really terrible, but that's all right. Uh, so you guys doing okay? Hear me okay? Everything Gucci? Um, all right, so uh, let's get to it then, I guess. Um, so we're going to start sort of the last um, major topic of the semester, which is uh, integration. So today's 15. Oops, let's do this in black. Um, so I, uh, you may have noticed I uh, scrolled, I mean, um, scaled my uh, input source here. So to get rid of those, uh, the letter boxing uh, as much as I could. So hopefully this is a little bit more uh, legible. Um, all right, so we're going to start uh, integration. Um, and the first section of the integration chapter, um, we've basically already done um, because we've already talked about antiderivatives and we've talked a lot actually about differential equations. So 5.1 in the Apex book um, should be kind of a recap of uh, a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about. So um, I'll give you guys a few exercises from that just for the sake of uh, cobweb cleaning. Um, so have a peek at that um, uh, and just make sure that everything's okay. But like I said, it's uh, stuff that we've talked about mostly already. So um, uh, since we started with the, the other book uh, before we moved on to to this one, thanks to COVID-19. Um, okay, so... Um, the um, uh, the the second section is really where we'll start here. Um, so let's start with kind of a silly example, um, just to sort of motivate things. Uh, suppose I travel 60 miles an hour towards Indy and um, well, yeah, just say 60 miles an hour. Um, I travel for, oh, well, let's just say 30 minutes. Ugh, it would help if I could spell this morning. How far have I gone? Okay, so kind of a silly question. Uh, at first glance, um, and this is a question that maybe you would have uh, encountered in, say, middle school or, or high school, you know, sort of first uh, a first class in algebra. Um, all right, so how far did I go? If I go for 30 minutes and I uh, or am going 60 miles an hour, then how far have I gone? And just type for me. 30 miles in a perfect world. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, okay. Now, how did you compute that is what I want to concentrate on, not so much the fact that the answer is, in this case, relatively obvious. Um, so, how did I compute this? Well, we said that we went 60 miles per hour times one half hour because 30 minutes is half an hour okay and that would be 30 miles okay so what we were using right is the whole distance equals rate times time uh, that you probably remember back from from school so um, 
you know, if you think back to your algebra class, you probably had a bunch of those problems, you know, where there's two trains and one leaves one city and another leaves another city and then you, you know, want to know when they pass each other and blah, 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 right? But basically all of those things came down to applications of distance equaling rate times time. Um, okay, but what I want to do is sort of think about a different way that we could visualize how we got 30 miles. And that is for me to graph um, the velocity uh, on uh, the y-axis, t uh, time I'll make the x-axis, and so let me just put, say, 1 there, the origin here, and uh, we were going 60 miles an hour. Okay, so I'll put, say, 60 there, and then one half an hour is there, and we were going at the constant rate of 60 miles an hour for that half an hour. And what happens after half an hour, I don't really care about. Um, so the product here that we got of 60 miles an hour times a half, okay, so that would be this, Notice that that's the same as asking uh, what's the area under our velocity curve. Okay, and uh, the reason they're the same, of course, is because w in this case, if our velocity curve is a constant, what's the area under that little piece of the curve? Well, it would just be the base times the height, because it's a rectangle, and the base is a half, because it's a half hour. The height is 60, because that was our, our speed, and so we went uh, 30 miles. Um, okay, does that sort of area view of it kind of make sense? Yes or no? We oui no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, good. You know, you guys can hop in Discord, and uh, then I can hear you, hear your your lovely voices, or or not. That's fine too. Um, let's see. See, shout out to uh, is Dr. Denari e on. Uh, Dr. Dunaway has uh, been coming to a lot of a lot of calculus streams. Uh, okay, so uh, the reason that we want to start to look at the area idea here is because not always. I mean, this is sort of a silly problem, right? It's silly in the sense that I mean, how often does your velocity is constant? right? Uh, that's something that, like, you get in algebra in high school, not so much here in college. Okay, but we can adapt the idea here. So let's, let's change the, the idea. Okay, suppose I travel at 60 miles per hour for one hour, or one half hour, sorry, towards Indy. I realize I forgot my wallet and have to turn around. Okay. So, um, this is actually slightly a trick question. There's two, perhaps two reasonable answers to this. So, let's say that I go 60 miles an hour for half an hour towards Indy, and then I go, oh, crap, I forgot my wallet. I was going to go to Indy to go shopping. Um, can't pay for anything without my wallet, so i got to turn around and go back. 
Uh, so let's also suppose that my car is magical and that I could just sort of instantly go from uh, one side of the highway to the other. That's obviously not reasonable, but let's just, um, yeah. Okay, so the question is how far have I gone? And Nate is exactly right here. Uh, what do I mean by how far have I gone? Displacement or total distance traveled? Okay, and both are reasonable answers to the question. So if I if I ask what is my net displacement, okay, then I think we should we could agree that the net is that I haven't gone anywhere, right? So if I drive 30 miles away from town and then turn right back around and drive 30 miles back, then it's as if I haven't gone anywhere at all. Um, but the total distance traveled, I think we would all agree, then would be 60 miles. I went 30 miles away, 30 miles back, and so the odometer on my car would read 60 miles bigger than it did when I started this journey. Okay, so let's, in terms of this area idea, think about how um, we would get both versions of the, the answer. Okay, so let me uh, graph it this time. But this time I'm going to go um, I'm going to think of traveling away from Indy or excuse me away from Crawfordsville uh, my velocity would be 60 miles an hour okay and if I turn around and come back then I'll think of my velocity as being negative because I'm moving backwards uh, even though the speed is 60, the velocity is minus 60. So the graph of my velocity curve would be this, and then let's suspend disbelief, and, um, you know, my car can't actually do this. Um, I, so we'll suspend disbelief to say that I go from magically being at... 60 miles an hour to instantly being at minus 60. That's not physically realistic, but but let's just run with it. Um, okay, so based on what we did a minute ago, the distance that I go um, total away from Crawfordsville is the area of that guy, and the distance that I come back is this guy. Okay, so what is the total... Let's say it this way. What's the net area here? Okay, so what do I mean by net area? Okay, so the area of the blue and the area of the green. So what's the area of the blue? Well, that's 30 miles, like we computed before. So what's the area of the green rectangle? Okay, and there's maybe two ways to answer this. Yeah, okay. So even though we normally don't talk about negative area, we're going to think of the latter area being negative uh, 30 because it's below the x-axis, okay, or t-axis in this case. Okay, so the net area would be 30 minus 30, equals zero miles, okay? And the total area would be, you take the absolute value of everything and add those together. So actually, let me, um, let me rewrite this right here, and I want to think about this as... 30 plus negative 30 rather than, I mean, that's the same thing as subtracting, of course. Um, 
but yeah okay so uh, this is the idea that we can figure out sort of the total displacement uh, by means of thinking about this um, uh, uh oh heft least uh, um, we can think about uh, what the the total displacement is um, by um, what um, by thinking about the 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 sort of net area counting things above the axis as positive and things below the axis as negative okay now both of these problems were relatively silly in the sense that we had constant uh, velocities, 60 miles an hour or minus 60 when we were coming back. Um, so what we want to do then is adapt this idea to when, um, when you don't have constant uh, areas. Okay, so let's, uh, let me move to another page uh, here and let's suppose Okay, so let's suppose that now we have a function for um, the velocity at time t, and um, let's suppose that it's um, 60 minus um, 60t, and we'll measure t in hours as we did before. Um, Okay, so how far have I gone after one hour? Okay, so now let's graph our um, our curve. So uh, I picked 60 minus 60 t not completely arbitrarily essentially what that would be is well how fast am I going at time zero I'd be going well 60 miles an hour because if I plug zero into that I get 60 and how fast would I be going at time one well I would be stopping so the velocity curve here is actually just a straight line let's see if I can actually draw a straight line this morning okay it would be that Okay, and so uh, based on this idea of the uh, displacement, or sorry, yeah, the net displacement equals net area, well, what's the net area here? Do we have any area below the t-axis? No, so all we want to do is figure out what's the area under the curve and what is that guys so what's the area of that blue blue stuff how do we compute that Yeah, it's 30, okay, and how did you compute that, of course, one-half base times height, because it's a triangle, equals 30. Okay, so, we, um, so we traveled 30 miles. Okay, now, had we, um, not thought about this sort of area interpretation, then if I had given you the question from the get-go, then 
uh, without sort of thinking about this geometrically, then it wouldn't have necessarily been so obvious how we would have gotten the answer. It was obvious in the previous two problems where we had sort of constant velocities. But if the velocity isn't constant, well then what? Okay, so um, we need basically to have a notation to represent kind of what we've computed here. And the notation is if we have, let's say, a function that does whatever, okay, all right, so if we have a function that goes from x equals a to x equals b, and it's just some squiggle, whatever, then the net area will denote, oh, that was terrible looking. Let's try this again. We'll denote that with this symbol, um, this symbol here okay so in terms of our previous problems Oops, that was bad, I meant a parenthesis. In terms of our previous problems, or the previous problem about our, our velocity that was the 60 minus 60t, this is what we computed. Uh, that's how we will notate what we just computed, okay? And of course, in that case, the geometry of the problem made it easy to find that area. We just sketched the graph, realized, oh, we've got a right triangle, no big deal, so um, so I can just use, uh, use the geometry that I've got, or uh, my knowledge of geometry, to, um, uh, to find that area. Okay, so um, this notation, does this make sense? And we'll talk a lot more about why this notation is written the way it is um, and sort of what the, the brilliant ideas are. Um, so this little S curve um, stands for um, basically uh, a word in Latin. It stands for summa. Um, but uh, in, in English, we call it the, the integral. So what we've defined here is the definite integral. Willy, we Gucci man. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. All right, excellent. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's start getting some spicier examples here. Uh, just for the sake of fun. Okay, so let's suppose Well, let me actually do Let me do this So um, This would be if we I'm going to separate it out from the idea of a story problem, okay, to say, let's just suppose that we've got this, uh, this definite integral, and uh, that square root function would be, well, I mean, that could be a velocity or something like that, um, but this thing, how would we interpret it geometrically? So what is, oops. God, my handwriting is terrible this morning. What curve is described by the square root of 1 minus x squared? So y equals square root of 1 minus x squared. What does that describe?
So guys, uh, congratulations. We now officially have more people in the stream that are actually in the class, so I'm going to be raking in all the sweet ad money here soon. Um, all right, so what curve is described by y equals square root of 1 minus x squared? Any, uh, any ideas? When I tell you guys what it is, you're going to be like, uh, nah, not quite. Uh, it 1 over um, that is the derivative of arc sine. It's, you're on the right track, Nate. Um, it, there is some trigonometric sort of stuff hidden in the background. Um, so I'll give you a hint. Why don't you square both sides? Okay, so if I square both sides of that equation, I get that. And uh, does that help at all? Yeah, it's a circle. Okay. So in this case, it's actually a unit circle um, with radius 1. Okay, so if I sketch the picture, then um, you guys are going to have to um, forgive my completely terrible art skills. There's a reason I'm a mathematician and not an artist. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so we've got uh, say negative one here and one there. Um, and so what we're looking for is the area. So what is the area? Of that, uh, that thing. Well, it's a circle, so for, we're fortunate that we learned a formula for that back in the day. So what is the area of that uh, semicircle? Or what's the area formula for a circle to begin with? Let's just start there. It's 8.30 in the morning. Yeah, it's pi r squared. Um, is anybody on central time, by the way, that's in the class? Um, we're on Eastern Time here in Indiana, so it's 8.30 in the morning. Uh, anybody on Central Time? Or even worse, Pacific or something like that? Um, all right, anyway, so the area would be 1 half pi r squared. Okay, now why is it 1 half in this case? Uh, it's because I only want um, the top half of the circle, right? Um, because that's between the curve and the t-axis. Uh, and in this case, the radius I chose was 1, just for convenience. And so we get 1 half. Oops, sorry, that's getting chopped off a little bit there. Um, come back up here. Uh, and so we get pi over 2. Okay, great. Um, all right, so any questions about that example? Basically, you know, uh, we don't know, so let me back up. There are ways that we're going to learn, we'll talk about them later, to actually compute these integrals without doing geometry. Um, but for now, basically, the only thing we have at our disposal is the geometry. Um, okay, so uh, any questions on this example before we keep on trucking? Gucci or are we Prada? All right. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and keep going then. So let me do another example that I think is uh, kind of fun. Okay, so I'm going to change the problem slightly, and I'm going to get rid of the square root. 
So what does y equals 1 minus x squared describe? Okay, so we've, I've ditched the square root this time. So what kind of curve do we have this time? Not a circle, but something else. Yeah, okay, so it's an upside down parabola. Okay, so if I sketch it, then it's a parabola. Okay. Now I know in my, my sketch here it looks kind of like a semicircle, but that's just because I suck as an artist. Um, but you guys buy that it's a parabola and not a uh, circle. Hopefully. Um, Alright, so the question is what's the area? Well, we don't know the formula for the area under a parabola, do we? Uh, in terms of geometry. Uh, area of a circle, great. Area under triangles or rectangles or things like that, also great. Um, but a parabola, eh, not something we actually know. All right, so I'm going to show you guys sort of a cool historical result, um, which is, I think, neat. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a parabola. And I'm going to draw a straight line that cuts it off. Okay. And then I'm going to draw basically the midpoint um, in the horizontal direction. Uh, wherever that lands on the parabola, I'll draw that third point. Okay. And so this figure is a parabolic segment. Okay, so that's what Archimedes calls it. And one of the things that Archimedes was really clever about doing is he noticed a couple of things. He noticed, let me draw in that triangle. Okay, so I had three special points and I can think about them forming a triangle. And so what he said was, well, the area of that parabolic segment sh probably has something to do with the area of that triangle. Now, clearly, the area of the parabolic segment's bigger, okay? But the question is sort of how much bigger. And one of the things that he figured out was this. Was that the area of the parabolic segment is in fact four thirds of the area of the enclosed triangle? All right, now how he did that is actually like just mind blowingly cool. Um, and if anybody's ever curious about that, then you can bug me. Um, but uh, this he proves this basically twice uh, using two different methods in a book called The Quadrature of the Parabola. Okay, so this is. Okay, so um, this result was maybe you know, 220, 250 BC, roughly, um, when he proved this. Um, okay, so uh, using what we have there, let's go back to our previous problem and say, well, we have here a parabolic segment. And if I draw my inscribed triangle, what's the area of the blue triangle from uh, that I've drawn in there? So what's the area of that blue triangle? Area of the blue triangle. Come on, guys, wake up. Well, okay, just the triangle. We'll get the uh, the rest of it later. Uh, so the triangle would be one half 
base times height. And the base here is 2 because I went from uh, x equals negative 1 to 1. And so in this case, we just get 1. Okay, so hence, well, um, let me write it this way, sorry. All right, so hence the area of that parabolic thing should be four-thirds times uh, the area of the triangle, which was one, so the area of the whole thing is four-thirds. Okay, now there's one thing that I, can, uh, that I have to stress. This only works for parabolas. Okay, so don't think that this four-thirds trick is going to work for other curves. It doesn't. Only works for parabolas. So, in a sense, uh, Archimedes' result is really cool because uh, this is one of the first uh, instances of finding the quadrature of a curved figure um, um, in antiquity. Um but uh, but it's also a very limited result in the sense that it only works for parabolas. It doesn't work for ellipses or hyperbolas or any other kind of curves that we want. So we kind of have to, in a sense, go back to the drawing board and come up with a more general method for, um, for doing this. Okay, so um, let's... Um, let me ask if there are any questions at this point. Um, over over kind of this this idea of area under the curve. Hopefully we're Gucci. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so we'll keep on trucking then. Um, so let's talk about um, some properties of the integral. Okay, so we'll kind of make a list here. All right, so the first one is that if you have the same number on the top and the bottom, then basically what that means is you're finding the area of a rectangle that has zero width. Okay, And it's not rocket science to realize that that ought to be zero. Graphically, what this would mean is that you have some curve and you're finding the area of that blue line, okay? So the blue line has no width, so what would you think it would be? Well, there's no width, so the total area is zero. Um, okay, the next property would be that if I, um, so let me sketch a, another curve here. Um, let's say that I have, um, I go from A to C and there's some point B in between, then what this is saying is the total area is equal to uh, the two pieces added together. So I can split an integral into two pieces, uh, or I could take two of them and put them back together to be one thing, uh, like so. Okay. Um, the other thing, or the next thing, would be if I...
if I reverse the order of the bounds, then I'll get the negative of the answer that I had. So kind of the idea here would be that um, if I'm thinking about an area from A to B, like say this, if I sort of am going backwards, okay, and so maybe I could think about, oh, um, yeah, if I sort of go backwards, then I should get the negative of what I had going forwards. So this would be kind of like uh, the intuition here would be um, when we drove 60 miles an hour away from Crawfordsville and we turned around and came back, well, let's think about it as so that one, that half an hour that I was driving away from Crawfordsville, I would say that I went uh, 30 miles, okay? Uh, but let's say that I had started 30 miles away from Crawfordsville and drove back to Crawfordsville. Well, then we would say that I had traveled negative 30 miles. I just reversed basically the direction. Um, okay, so uh, so we've got that. Um, the um, um, if I have two functions. then I can split it like this. Okay, um, and this works plus or minus, uh, just as supposing that you keep track of the minus signs. Um, and that works because um, uh, basically what you're doing um, is, uh, since we're finding areas, um, the it shouldn't matter if you compute the answer in two pieces and then add the answers together or if you do it all in one swell foop. Um, yeah, okay. So these are all properties of the definite integral. Uh, and there's a list of these on page, uh, looks like 211. of Apex uh, just for um, uh, for uh, edification. Um, okay, so um, let's um, let's move on and well first off let me pause and make sure that there are uh, see if there are any questions. <laughs> All right, good morning. It's Dr. Denarii. We should all raid his channel later, uh, so you can, uh, well, but uh, Dr. Dunaway, you can't do a definite integral without first understanding indefinite integrals, so maybe indefinite integrals are the best integrals. We can uh, fight at the flagpole at 3 o'clock if you disagree. Um, so, um, okay, so the... The next thing we want to do, <laughs> yes, of course, um, yeah, you can forget the plus C. So the next thing we want to do, let's actually go back up to um, to my little uh, Archimedes trick, is if we didn't have a parabola, how on earth would we solve this problem? Okay, another way to say this would be, how do we even know that this four-thirds thing actually works at all? Okay, um, and so how could we prove, in a sense, that that works? And the way that we want to do that is to kind of go back and think about uh, how did we define the derivative in the first place? Okay, so maybe that would be a good thing to kind of wrap up with today. So let me go to a new page here, and let's just say blast from past. How did we define the derivative? Okay, so if I had some curve and I pick some point on it, what was the derivative at that point?
Well, actually, you know what? Let me slightly change my uh, picture uh, for reasons that will become clear in just a second. Okay, so what is the derivative at um, A? What was the geometric definition of this? Yeah, okay, so geometrically this would be slope of the tangent line. Okay, so if I draw my tangent line here, it has whatever slope it has. Okay, now, I could draw that tangent line and say, okay, it's got whatever slope, but how do we actually compute that? What we did was we said, okay, let's imagine going over h units and computing the slope not of the tangent line, but of the secant line. And the slope of the secant line, well, it's rise over run, right? So that was the rise, and that was the run. Okay, so the slope of our secant was that thing which of course looks very familiar, right? Um, that was our difference quotient. Okay, so then what we did was we said, so slope of the tangent would be the limit as h goes to zero of that thing. And we denoted that with f prime of a. Okay, so the key to what we did with to make secants into tangents was the idea of taking a limit. So the this part, the slope of the secant, is approximately the slope of the tangent. It's not perfect, but it's close. And if we make h smaller and smaller and smaller, then our approximations of the slope get more and more and more accurate. And so in a limit sense, they're going to be, uh, the, the limit of it would be exactly right on. Okay, so what we want to do is basically play this game with our idea of definite integral. We'll think about how do we approximate uh, the area under a curve. So not get it perfect, but just approximate it. And then if we can come up with a way to make that um, approximation successively more and more accurate, then that's sort of the, the idea of taking a limit, and we'll be able to build uh, the, the idea of a definite integral um, in a direct computational way. Um, okay, so that's where we'll pick up, I think, on Wednesday. Um, so um, just a couple of pieces of business. Um, now that we're um, back to some stuff that's in the book, uh, I'll give you guys some uh, some more infinity exercises, uh, so I'm going to get those posted here uh, today, um, and um, uh, I'll probably give you guys like uh, one or two things from the Euler's method stuff, which is, uh, if you want to look at that in the book, it's actually in volume two of the book, uh, the Calc 2 part of it. Um, it's okay that it's in the Calc 2 part. Um, really only uses Calc 1 ideas, so it's not th that big of a deal. Um, okay, so I'll get those things posted to Edfinity, and I should have the project uh, the project description and stuff uh, put together in the next day or two, uh, so I'll get that uploaded to Canvas also. Um, all right, so we'll quit the stream here. If you guys have any questions, uh, hit me up on Discord or email or whatever. And I will see you guys on uh, Wednesday, if not sooner.